Oh. Not at the time of the lesson as he understands. You know, growing up, uh, and we were lukewarm at best. I, I, I'll tell you that. We, we were not what you what the Bible would describe as Christians and faithful Christians and involved Christians and serving Christians. We were lukewarm, and Jesus said lukewarm as, as those he's going to spew out of his mouth, literally in the Greek to vomit up. Um, and, and so I'm not saying we had a pristine Christian raising by any, any stretch of the imagination, but, but, you know, we were taught in my generation a lot of time, you know, you always hear your mama or your daddy say to you, you better know that God is watching you. And it wasn't in like a loving, kind way. It's like God's watching you because he's waiting for you to mess up. And as soon as you do, bam, did I wake you up? I mean, he's going to get you, boy, you know. Now God's after you. You know, that's kind of the idea, you know. The all-seeing eye of God they would talk about. You know? When I was a kid, my, we lived with our grandmom, and they lived in an old house, an old neighborhood, and they were all built up off the ground, you know, and and uh, and pretty good crawl space. So I'd get under the house thinking I could do evil little things, and God wouldn't see me under the house, you know. And uh, and so, you know, uh, but, but 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 I kind of grew up with that idea that, that God was a God of wrath and that, that, that he's just waiting for us to mess up, you know, that he's kind of holding us by a string over hell and kind of threatening to let us go and kind of grinning like, ah, ha, 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 I got you, boy, you know, kind of idea. And brothers and sisters, the Bible is far from that. Now, God is a God of wrath and can be, as we've seen in the Old Testament, as we've seen when him deal with certain countries. And and um, and we understand that. But brothers and sisters, there's another aspect to God's nature that I think sometimes we miss, or I certainly did growing up, that I want to talk about. And from the book of Hebrews, I love of Hebrews. I love teaching it. I love preaching it. It's, it's, it's every verse is so full of, of just such good stuff. And the book of Hebrews is written to encourage the Jewish Christians to persevere. That's why it's called Hebrews. Um, and and he was uh, the writer was encouraging them to remain with the religion of the crucified Christ and not to leave that and not to fall away but to hold on to this uh, and to hold on it with boldness and with hope in Jesus Christ. You see, brethren, a lot of the Christians in this instance were going back into the world, or, or most of them were going back into Judaism that they had come out of. And there was two main reasons for this. One was persecution. The early church was persecuted severely. And um, and so <clears throat> there was that aspect of it. And when you're being persecuted, it's, it's, you can kind of look at uh, the other side of the fence and say, well, we didn't have it this bad in the Jewish community, you see. And and so pers- persecution had a lot to do with it. And also Jewish persuasion, or what we would call peer pressure today, man. Then You know, them parents didn't like their young ones going off into this newfound religion called Christianity. You know, the Jewish system had been around for thousands of years, and that's what they felt like they should remain in. And the argument, they would say, that the Jewish system with the Mosaic law is the best way to go. They, they would argue that, that the Christian religion they taught has no tabernacle, which means no holy place, so where they could go before God, that the Christian religion had no sacrificial system, and that it had no high priest. And, and all of these things were so vital in, in coming to God and worshiping God and receiving forgiveness of your sins. And, and so then the author of, of Hebrews um, really does a marvelous job of answering these false charges against Christ. Christ and his church. And he and he says throughout the book, in fact, if you just go through the book of Hebrews and underline the word better or best, you are more excellent in some versions. You, you will see so many, you know, we have the better way, brothers and sisters. We do, and we should thank God for that. And, and, and the author of Hebrews is trying to help the, the Hebrew Christians who had formerly been in the um, uh, Judaism under the Old Covenant, that they need to understand that they've got the best. And man alive, if you can drive a new Cadillac while well, drive a 20-year-old Volkswagen Beetle, right? And, and so don't go back to that, that you're giving up the best for something far less um, good in that. And, and, and that's his whole argument, brothers and sisters, and he says, Christ's way is superior. And, and Brendan, I want us to take this. We've never been in the Jew. I, I don't know that we've got any former Jews in here. I wouldn't think so. But, but we do have the better covenant. And that's what I want us to understand and how God understands in this covenant. Christ's way, he begins by saying is superior. So he said, don't give it up. In fact, cling to it with great confidence and boldness and hang on to it. But in brothers and sisters, we need to understand that it's still superior to all other religions today. I know that if you talk with a lot of people in other religions, they'll come out and tell you, oh, our way is the better way and this way is the best and all this here kind of stuff. You know, it's not. Nothing can beat Jesus Christ and his church and, and, the, and what we call the religion of the Lord. 
it's still superior to all other, quote, religions today. And so, and so then he gives the presentation, the proof. Let me give you a brief outline of, of what he says is, okay? He says, one of the first couple of chapters, Christ is better than the angels. See, that was very important to the Jewish community, and some of them even worshipped angels. And he says, Christ is superior to the angels. And he says, secondly, chapter 3 and, and part of chapter 4 is that Christ is superior to Moses. He's better than Moses. Oh, my goodness. Moses is the most revered character in all of Judaism, with the exception of God himself. I mean, he was right up there. And to say that, that the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is superior to Moses, was, man, you better be ready to defend that. He Thirdly, he says, we, have, we do indeed have a high priest, and that he is a much better high priest. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. That's from chapter 4 to chapter 7. And then he says he, this, this high priest is the author of a better covenant, chapter 7 and 8. He says that, um, that this, uh, this high priest provides better sacrifices. And then he says that um, the, he goes on in chapter 11 that we know is the great hall of faith, the necessity of having faith in God. And as a result of having a, a genuine, loving, living faith in God, we're going to have better fellowship with God under the new covenant than they were able to have under the old. And then um, number seven or eight, what, what are seven? Christ expects better uh, service of his disciple. If we have the better and the best, brothers and sisters, then my goodness, we should be given all the more to our Lord than they did under the Jewish system. Amen. I mean, that's what we should be doing. And so and so the Jews would argue and, and to get the people back into the Judaism and they'd say, your system has no high priest. And brethren, that scared the bejeevers out of them. Okay, that's a fearful statement because the main duty of the high priest was to go before God on behalf of the people and, and, and offer on his own behalf in, in order to offer sacrifices to the sins. And once they offer sacrifice for the atonement and so appeasing the wrath of God. So without a high priest, then, then they believe you had no access to God. You see, and and so and so that was a very very fearful and fearful thing. That's why the Day of Atonement that they had once a year was such a fearful thing for all of Judaism, because they once a year, you know, that high priest went before the Lord. He went into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, as it were, and he offered all those sacrifices. And 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 if he did not come out at the end of the day, it meant God hadn't forgiven their sins. He hadn't accepted their sacrifice, and they were done for. They would actually tie a rope onto the high priest. So that if he didn't come out at the end of the day, they could actually drag him out because they figured he would be dead. It was a very fearful time. And, and so then to say to the, these Christians, oh, you have no high priest to offer atonement for your sin and offer sacrifices for your sin. Therefore, you're still in your sins. That just scared the mud out of them, brothers and sisters. And, and so the author goes on to explain this is exactly what Christ did, that Jesus he became to us, as the Bible says, and we're going to see here in a minute, both the perfect high priest, one without sin, and also the perfect sacrifice. The high priest offered up a lamb, a perfect lamb without flaw on the day of atonement for the sins of the people. When John the baptizer introduced Jesus to his disciples, <coughs> he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The people understood that connotation. And so, brethren, <coughs> I'm sorry, I got that Ohio Valley scratch. Um, and, so, and so then Jesus not only become the high priest that made the sacrifice, he become the sacrifice. He become the Lamb of God, and he offers himself. And so he, and so the, and the Bible goes on to say, as the author of Hebrews says, he was offered once for all time. He was offered once for everybody, for all time, and he didn't have to keep doing it year in and year out like the, high, the priest in the Old Covenant have to do. <coughs> and in chapter 4, verse 14, we're going to read these verses in just a minute. But chapter 4, verse 14 says, We have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. See, brethren, we don't understand not being from a Jewish background the connotation of that. The high priest had to pass through once a year on the Day of Atonement, the Holy of Holies. He went behind those thick curtains and, and walked into the Holy of Holies. Anybody else, any other priest that went into those Holy of Holies was struck dead immediately. And only on the Day of Atonement could the high priest go in. And he, and he would go into the and presence of God as where God were there sitting on the throne, as it were, on the Ark of the Covenant. 
And he would go really into the presence of God on behalf of the people. And he said, this is what our high priest did. He didn't go into some earthly tabernacle. He went into the heavens to the very throne of God. And brethren, he is still there mediating on our behalf. That's the good news. So he said, we have a superior high priest. We have a great high priest. He is a high priest, the Bible says, who under stands. Let's look at our text this afternoon, okay? Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16 is one, then we're going to look in Hebrews 2, because actually he's, he's building on what was said in Hebrews 2. Now, I'll tell you what, let's do. I got them in, I got them in reverse order. That's okay. That's right. Good. We'll start here. Okay, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, this is such good news to these Christians. He said, not only do we have a high priest, we have a great high priest. And not only do we have a great high priest, we has one that had not, he didn't just go into some early tabernacle. When he died on the cross, he went into the heavens. He went before the very throne of God. He passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and so let us hold fast our confession. He, we're going to talk about that in a minute. He said, you hold on to it, okay? For we do not, verse 15, brethren, listen to this. This is such good news for us. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore... Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. And so, brothers and sisters, we have a high priest who understands. We have a high priest who's gone before God Almighty, and he has offered himself once for all time and is mediating on our behalf. Now, now he's built, he's, he's mentioned this verse, he's building on what he said in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. So if you go back just a page or two, and this is what he says, talking about our high priest, okay? Talking about Jesus Christ, verse 7. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. In all things, brethren, Jesus become, he emptied himself. The kenosis is called in the Greek. He emptied himself when he left the throne of heaven and came to this earth and became human flesh. So he had to be made like his brethren in all things. Why? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that we which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Beloved, that is such good news. That is such good news. Because the devil is the tempter. And he's going to always tempt us. And Jesus is always going to come to our aid. You see, man-made gods were always full of wrath and vengeance. They were never loving and caring except for themselves. And they stayed high up in their heavens and aloof from the people. Jesus Christ, they, he is God among us. He, he come, become flesh. He was God incarnate. He become flesh. He lived in the same flesh we occupy. He lived the same life we have to live on this earth with the exception that he did not sin. You see, that's the way our Lord is. And the Bible says he understands. He understands our weaknesses. He understands how we live. He understands that. Why? Because he's been tempted in everything that we have. As the Bible says in our text, he's been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. But brothers and sisters, as one scholar said, Jesus has been tempted far beyond us because we in our human flesh and our human weaknesses often give in to the temptation of Satan somewhere down here. He opened up with Jesus on both barrels and Jesus never sinned, so he gives in to everything. And so Jesus understands. He is our high priest and our high priest, the Bible says, is touched by our weaknesses. He's not vengeful. He's not full of wrath. He's not angry. Now, rather than he can be if, if, we, if we provoke him enough. But we're talking about his children, his brethren, his members of his body, his church, who, who are imperfect Christians, who are trying, who are striving, and yet even at our best still fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says in chapter 4, verse 15, he is one of sympathy, that he is able to sympathize with us. The Greek word for sympathy means to get inside of and to suffer with. He does that. But then also, brothers and sisters, he has empathy. See, I can sympathize with somebody and, and not experience what they're going through. 
But when you go through the same thing that someone else is going through or has gone through, then you can empathize with them. Closely related, but different. There's one thing to show sympathy, and we should. But when you can show empathy, when you can say to somebody, oh, yeah, I went through the exact same thing. I've been there. I know what you're experiencing. Then that's that's empathy. Brother, when someone loses a child, all I can do is sympathize with them. I hope and pray I never have to empathize with them because I don't want to do that. But that's empathy. That's empathy. We've had people lose children that I have called people up and said, go see so-and-so right now. Why? Because they've lost a child. And they know. They know. They know what to say. They know what not to say. They know what to do. Our high priest sympathizes with us, and he has empathy for us. He can put his arm around us and say, I know what you're going through. I've suffered too. That's the high priest that we have today. His compassion, his mercy, the Bible says. He understands. I'm not saying he condones our sin, brothers and sisters. The Bible says God hates sin. And God sin nailed Jesus to the cross. I'm not saying he, he t- turns a blind eye and, and, and kind of winks and nod and, and says, oh, no, it's really not that serious. And no, no, no. The wages of sin is death. We understand the seriousness of sin, and so does Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. But, but he has an understanding heart. He's been in the flesh. He's been through what we're going through. He understands. And so are you weak? And we should all say, yes, and Christ sympathizes with you. Are you suffering? He suffers with you. Are you tempted? He was also tempted in every way we are. He knows, brothers and sisters, he understands that. And, you know, in my frustration sometimes, because, brother, I, I really thought that, you know, when I first become a Christian, you know, and I thought, man, by the time I get to, you know, 40 years into the ministry, I'm going to be some super Christian, right? And, you know, I mean, I, I'm going to have it, all the answers, and I'm going to be so strong, and the devil's not going to be able to tempt me, because I'm going to have 40 years of living for Christ behind me, and, and, and man, I'm going to take, get behind me, Satan, and I'm going to kick his behind, and I'm going to spin his eye, and I'm going to be so strong in Christ, and I have been so wrong. Brothers and sisters, you know, as a senior citizen, I still struggle. And in my frustration, I sometimes say, Lord, I've tried. I'm trying so hard to resist sin, and I'm trying to do right, and I give it my all, and, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can do in my human power, and yet I still fall, I still stumble, I still mess up. And Christ proverbially speaking, wraps his loving arms around us and says, I know, I know, I've, I've been there. I've faced those same temptations. I understand. He doesn't condemn, brethren. He comforts. Have you noticed when he was on this earth, every time he was brought, a sinner was brought to him or he was confronted a sinner and you know, that was in what we would call horrible sins, you know. He dealt with them tenderly and with compassion. Aren't you glad we have a high priest that's that way? That you can go to with tears in your eyes and say, Lord, I messed up for the billionth time. I, I've just really messed up again. And you're not going to hear, well, you sorry, no good for nothing, servant. I'm just going to send you straight to hell. There's some that preach that. That's not what Hebrew preaches. We have a faithful, loving, merciful, compassionate, understanding high priest. As our high priest, the Bible says that Christ is our mediator. A mediator is in, in the Greek is a go-between. It's someone that stands between you and, and someone that's pressing charges, so to speak, against you. And Jesus is our mediator. I can just hear him saying something like this. I'm not trying to put words in the Lord's mouth. I'm, not, I'm just saying, you know, in this scenario, what does a mediator do? He's a go-between. He stands on your behalf. And, and I can just hear him saying something like this. Father, I was human flesh. I was there. I was on planet Earth. I was tempted in every way they were. 
And, and I know what your children are going through. And I, I know. Brethren, when life beats us down and when things just seem unbearable, we don't go to a God that doesn't understand, as our two sections of Scripture have pointed out. We go to a God that's been there, literally, has been where we're at. That is why he finds it so easy to forgive. That is why the Bible says he is eager to forgive. He died on a cross so we could be forgiven. So we serve that wonderful, loving Lord and Savior and high priest who sacrificed himself and become the Lamb of God. So what do we need to do then? What's our response? As one preacher, how then shall we live? You see this a lot in Hebrews. The apostle will talk about certain things, and then he'll say at the conclusion of that, therefore let us. And he tells us to let us. Okay? He says, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens in the very presence of God, who is so compassionate and loving and understanding and merciful and knows what we go through, chapter 4, verse 14, he says there, therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. That literally means you remain in the religion of Jesus Christ no matter what. You know what it means to hold fast? You ever had a bulldog? Ed Guess down in Valdosta, Georgia, you'd have no Ed, a fine Christian, uh, just a country boy. And he had a little bulldog, and, and his boy had a go-kart, man. And, I mean, that was a, a souped-up little go-kart, and, and, and Rebel was his name. You, he's down south. He's got to be called Rebel, right? And Rebel was his name, and Rebel liked to insist on the ride, sitting right on that seat beside whoever was driving that go-kart. And Scott, his son, would jump in that go-kart, and he'd try to sneak off and run off without Rebel. And he'd run that thing up and get it going fast and take off. And Rebel would come flying from wherever he was, and he'd run, and he'd grab the front tire, and he'd hold on to it so tight that the back wheels would just spin. He wasn't going to let he was not going to let go. He was going to cling to that tire until Scott finally let off the gas and he knew he could jump in on the seat and be there with him and ride with him. He, brethren, that's we got to have that bulldog tenacity, okay? We've got to have that where you cling to it, where you don't give up on it no matter what. And sadly, I've seen too many Christians that are so willing to leave the Lord and his church over some little bitty something. You know, I don't like the way they sing them songs. I don't like the way they painted the building. I don't like the way they, you know, whatever it may be. It's so pitiful. And then the apostle said, no, you need to understand what you have. Don't throw it away. Cling to it. Hold fast no matter what. Don't leave. You continue to serve God no matter how appealing something else may be. Don't allow uh, anyone or anything to turn you away from Jesus Christ. And we know the devil's going to always be trying to do that. And then the next, uh, the, uh, don't, don't allow persuasive argument, as the Apostle Paul says later on to Timothy, not persecution. These people were being persecuted, not against anything and anyone. That's why he writes Hebrews 11 and says, y'all think you're having it tough here and being persecuted here? Look at what your forefathers went through. And he starts, y'all, y'all read Hebrews 11 and all the many, many women. He gets to the end and said, you know what? Time would fail me to, to mention any names of other people. And he said, all these died in faith, you know. And, and brethren, I just, you know what? And on the day of judgment, I hope I'm not standing by one of those folk. You know? Can you imagine some of our modern-day Christians, you know, they, oh, well, yeah, you here at the day of judgment? And they said, we all are, you know. And said, uh, did you serve the Lord faithfully? And said, um, You know, and they said, what? Yeah. And said, I, I live back in such and such a date, and they took my home and my and uh, ever, my property and my business away from me because I wouldn't give my allegiance to Rome and, renou- and renounce Christ. And, and oh, really? What, well, what else happened? Well, after a while, and they saw I wasn't going to give in. They, they killed my family, and then they killed me. I was martyred for Christ. Now, can you imagine that person turning to a modern-day Christian and says, um, how did you serve the Lord? Well... I, I used to serve God. I used to be a faithful Christian, as we would say, but somebody at church made me mad. Somebody at church offended me. That preacher didn't talk to me one day. So I left the church. Can you imagine standing by 
one of these people like that in Hebrews 11. Brethren, the apostle says, you hold fast. You cling to it. You do not give up no matter what. God's way is always the best way. We have the better covenant in Jesus Christ. We have the better everything in Christ. So he says, cling to, and then he says in verse 16, let us draw near. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Some versions say boldness. What well, well, one preacher calls a holy boldness, not an arrogance, not a pride, but a boldness, not, not confidence in ourselves and in, in anything that we've done, but confidence in a loving God who's been where we are and are willing to forgive. That's how we can come boldly. In the old covenant, when they come before God, for the most part, they become before God a God that they saw as a God of wrath, and they came with fear and trembling. And, and, and he said, no, 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 you come. You come because of Jesus Christ and because of our high priest and because of who he is and what he's done and where he's been and the experiences he's had like we've had. You can come boldly before him. You can come confidently before him and so therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace they didn't have a throne of grace under the old covenant so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need brothers and sisters jesus uh, the Jews believed that, I'm sorry, I should say the Jews believed that only the high priest could draw near and then to God and then only with fear and great trembling. And he said, not so with Jesus. You come boldly before the throne of God. You come confidently before the throne of God. And, and, and so we, he said, what do you receive? What are we going to receive by drawing near to Christ, to his throne, and, and, and praying to him the way that we should? He said, you're going to receive mercy. You're going to receive grace. You're going to receive help, chapter 4, 16, and then verse 18 of chapter 2 adds aid. God's going to be there for you, brethren. That's the Lord we serve. That's the high priest that we have. That is reason to rejoice. It is reason to <clears throat> remain in Christ and with Christ no matter how hard things get in this life. And the devil can make sure our life gets tough. But we remain with him. No matter what, brethren, no excuses, none, none. We remain with the Lord. Will it be worth it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love Romans 8, 18. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present world are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. 30 seconds in heaven. We'll know. We'll know it was worth it. Amen. Whatever you got to lose, whatever you got to give up, whatever you got to sacrifice, whatever, whatever you have to do to remain in Jesus Christ, do so. Every one of us in this audience that's of any age whatsoever, every one of us can look around and, and say people that, and, and know of people that used to be here and used to be here faithfully that's bowed out in the world now. Don't do that. Don't do that. You cling tenaciously to your high priest.